Good morning. We're not doing any live demos, so nothing can go wrong. <laughs> that wasn't our music, right? That was not our music no, either. We picked no. the music yesterday. So uh, those guys up there will get get to get a get to hear about that later on. Um, to get started, I just want to go down the line. It's not something I want to do for the whole panel, but just for this one question. Talk to me for a moment about why you chose Cloud Foundry and how many developers do you support at this point? And why don't we just go down the line, start with our friend from Boeing. And sure, I'll get started the other line. <laughs> so um, at Boeing, um, I used to run the enterprise cloud services prior to taking the digital transformation environment. And one of the things that we really wanted to do was to really focus on the real transformation, which is with people. So getting the culture changed, getting us more um, agile, leveraging some of the lean principles that we already love and, and use for the last few years. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to focus on the people by making technology abundantly easy to use. And, and the first things that, that I've done is implement the Cloud Foundry with a pivotal distribution, um, as well as get a DevOps tool chain in place. So that really helped us transform the conversation from which technologies to use, which containers, like how to deploy cloud. It became more about how do we actually focus on the business? How do we focus on enabling delivery and, and the velocity? Um, and we did that actually uh, within the first 80 days. We had our first production Cloud Foundry implementation. Uh, with all the processes, uh, as well as our first uh, full end-to-end -end DevOps tool chain in place, so we can focus on developing code at the, at the rate we need it. And I think you asked about the, the scale as well. So uh, that started about uh, 650 days ago, and that's about a year and a half. You're uh, counting? <laughs> yeah, we're counting. We have a website we count every day. Um, so we went from no users in Cloud Foundry to now about 2,000 users and uh, several thousand application instances. And, and I think that's about 1,000 um, um, production applications. And, and we checked a couple of weeks ago. I was at Spring One, and, and we checked the, the push on a Friday, which is a slow day for us. And we had over 300 pushes to production in that one day, which is pretty amazing for Boeing. At scale. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we use uh, uh, Cloud Foundry at Fiserv to underpin our uh, FinKit platform application runtime. Uh, and that was driven largely by very similar uh, drivers to Ennis there around uh, an older legacy platform um, where change and release is where kind of on the quarterly, <laughs> six monthly, possibly annually type basis. Um, and clearly, that wasn't a, a model that was satisfying for us or our customers. Uh, and so we were looking to move towards a model uh, which is supported by Cloud Foundry, which helps us to um, engage better with our development community to be able to deliver change more quickly. Um, we've enhanced the Cloud Foundry kind of application runtime with our own developer environment, with an application to, um, a developer tool chain and a developer pi and a, a pipeline. Um, so that we can push that change now, rather than quarterly, six monthly, yearly, we're now making you know several hundred changes a day. Uh, so it's a, a massive step change into in, in the way that we work. Me? Yep. I, I guess I'll talk not only about uh, Cognizant's usage of Cloud Foundry, but how our our uh, clients are are using the software. Um, I, I can't believe I didn't tell this funny story yesterday. I, I flew in yesterday morning uh, from the US, super jet lagged, and uh, jump into a cab. And if you've been in a cab here, it's like a, you know, a, a breakneck experience. We were left and right and up and down roads and all over the place. And I, you know, I, was, I was terrified. Where did that cab driver take you? It was, it was coming from the airport. It was like fast and furious. I was like, this is insane. <laughs> And, and it, it got me thinking that, you know, I'm in this cab and I'm feeling terrified. And, and when I talk to our clients and I, I meet and talk to people about their transformation and their adoption of technology, they kind of feel the same way. Uh, they'll talk about their legacy portfolios and they will say, how do we achieve uh, outcomes 
better outcomes, velocity, value. How do we take all of this, this value that's locked up and drives revenue for our business? How do we take that on a journey? And then in the process, how do we you know, redefine uh, those user experiences and, and, and go to market more competitively? So we're all in this kind of breakneck uh, you know, technology adoption, and it is all about velocity. We've got to be able to go fast. And when I think about what we do and what we all do in this room, we lead transformation in a time of relentless change. And you know, if you take the, the train home tonight because you're afraid, afraid to take the taxi, and uh, you talk to someone next to you and you tell them you lead in a time of relentless change, they're going to say, wow, that's exhausting. And it is. So how do you make it less exhausting? By embracing a technology, by embracing a platform that enables velocity, cloud portability, and flexibility so that you can focus on your, your, your business outcomes. That's what Cloud Foundry means to us and our clients. I took the bus from the airport. It was very pleasant. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe that's more like Cloud Foundry. Um, Mickey, when I think about government, I don't necessarily think about speed and fast. Um, why did you choose Cloud Foundry? Um, so, the, so the answer to that is the bit of government I work for, GDS. Um, we started like six years ago with a mission to digitally transform government way back before digital transformation was the, the current big thing. Um, and so for us, um, we got into Cloud, Cloud Foundry when we were, we are a small bit of government, government is 500 times bigger than us, what do we give them as a platform that they can run things on in a modern way? Um, Cloud Foundry was easily the most mature and secure option at the time, um, and we think it, it still is. Um, so we have hundreds of apps, no good idea of developers, but hundreds to thousands. Um, and yeah. It just works? It's going well. Yeah, it, there's interesting challenges um, when it comes to legacy stuff, naturally. Um, partly, be <coughs> partly because we've been successful. Um, other government departments have found modern platforms to host their own huge projects, but as I'm sure people at enterprises can appreciate, most of the projects out there that are important aren't that huge. Um, and so we offer, um, we offer a well-supported platform for those services which aren't huge, um, but that are still quite important. Um, yeah. Now you guys are just starting out. Yes. In a Thales Digital Factory, the, we start the journey maybe one, one year ago, and we, we bootstrap our platform in January last year, so we are really at the beginning. But uh, we choose Cloud Foundry because it's a major pl platform uh, used by big industries, and Thales, we are a big industry. We have critical payloads that we have to host and to, to run for our clients, and uh, Cloud Foundry uh, appear as a good solution, the solutions that uh, provide the right level of security, the, the right level of uh, configurability. And what we target with that is to reduce the, the, the time to market of the applications that uh, our software team provides. So uh, before, before using such platform, the time, the time between the, the start of the project and the real work start was maybe four months to, to order the server, to get all the authorization, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now we are able to kickstart a project in one hour as soon as we have the, the project request, and the software team can push its application after one hour. So that's really something that, that works. Also, we want to increase the developer productivity what we don't want is that developers uh, talk about infrastructure on, let's say, waste time on boiler, boilerplate code instead of focusing on the, um, on the business code. So what we, why we choose Cloud Foundry is because the developer just push a binary and, it, and then it works. They forget how, but it just works. 
<laughs> Good. And, and consistency of deployment across clouds too, right? It's also important. And do most of, I know at Boeing you use lots of different clouds as well, <laughs> um, up to the point where it's painful, I think, for you, right? Is that? Yeah, yeah, we, um, I called it yesterday, I think we were cloud poor uh, when I first started in 2013. Uh, and now we're at the point of we sign contracts with all the three big um, uh, cloud providers. Uh, one we use more heavily than the other two. Um, and then we now have VMware-based internal cloud that's been running for a little while. Um, and then we're also, uh, we have OpenStack. So we're now at least five clouds, and we're also looking at another deployment of um, um, container service. So yeah, we're, we're cloud rich right now. And one of the things that I think that was mentioned earlier that Abby uh, covered, that it's very important that as we're getting cloud rich, a lot of us are getting the push and demand from either our internal customers or just the, the different technologies. It's important these open source projects to, to work with each other. And one of the things that I really like about Cloud Foundry and, and the focus with Pivotal is to, um, to really make it easy for the developers and business to adopt technology. So the more of these variations come in, we, I expect more of the open source communities to work with each other and make it easy and continue to make it easy for us to consume the cloud and not have to jump ship into another cloud. That just mm -hmm. will take us back a few years. Now, I think the yeah. adoption of Cloud Foundry is also, we see it organic. Uh, you know, as developers and, and people are exposed to technology and they're experimenting with new technologies, they're, they kind of begin from the end. And, and the end is how do we deploy this quickly and how do we get user feedback and ensure that the user is omnipresent. And, and when you think from that point of view, you, you, you sort of back into solutions like you know, Bosch and, and you, you think, how do we deploy this to multiple clouds in a consistent way? You know, as, as fun as it is to carry a pager, nobody really wants to do it anymore. <laughs> um, so you, you're thinking, how can we achieve that same uh, you know, rigorous SLA across all these different clouds, but the same value and the same outcome to users? So in our experience, it is people fall into it organically as the right tool for the job. But I think also as well, I think it's, uh, it's really, you mentioned Bosch there and um, using Bosch to manage your Cloud Foundry foundations across multiple clouds mm -hmm. is awesome. But the extension of that um, part of the Cloud Foundry or, um, uh, ecosystem can actually be extended beyond Cloud Foundry, right? right? And so we're kind of, at FISA, if we're using Bosch to actually manage our um, non-Cloud Foundry um, parts of our tool chain as well, uh, which, is, which is great, you know? Yeah. And so all of that stuff about, you know, not worrying about carrying yeah. a pager and being able to autonomously update our entire estate yeah. within reason using Bosch is incredibly powerful and another reason why we're so engaged with the Cloud Foundry community. Yeah, that's a great point. Do others do the same here? I know you guys love Bosch. That's the first thing I heard about you, with your love for Bosch. But Mickey, do you? I, I guess we've tended to make pretty like use of Bosch um, in that it's an incredibly powerful tool. Um, but as much as possible, we have other people host things like databases and so on that otherwise we'd have Bosch host. Um, virtually, we, we have worked with other governments a bit on creating open source service brokers out there to use. Um, and, and I think for us, that's taken away from Bosch usage a lot um, because a lot of things we'd use Bosch to do, we can pay other people to do better. <laughs> Ooh. Wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Can I get some hate? Mic drop, he said it. <laughs> do, do you take that as a personal affront? I think... Um, <laughs> Not a personal affront, no. I think, right, it's, it's horses for courses, right? And it's really easy to get engaged in kind of flame wars about what's great technology and, and how, you've got to do what's right for you and your organization. Um, uh, for us, um, our default go-to is, is Bosch for pretty much anything. Um, uh, we're not dogmatic about it. Um, if it's not a good fit, we won't use it. But um, the, the, that combined with concourse means that we're running our entire, um, we're running seven foundations and a number of um, uh, other kind of build tool chain stuff with a team of about nine people. Yeah. That's, that's the win. 
And I'll pile on that. Um, I mean, I, I intentionally don't want to talk about specific components because it gets into yeah. personal traits and, <laughs> and in, interests. But the thing that I like about that, uh, the, what Bosch provides, is we have about four people, and they weren't even full time until we became fully cloud rich. Now we're going to need a couple more. But less than four people for FTEs to support a couple of thousand developers and fully automated. And our security actually loves Bosch more than yeah. anyone else because it automatically repaves the, the virtual machines all the time. So it, it helps us with our security posture as well. So uh, it's uh, just economics. That, that security point is a really good one. So uh, the Spectre meltdown. Uh, thing that came out a while ago, we were able to patch our entire Cloud Foundry estate in like a day. It was a, it was a click of a button. I, I think it's funny because it is almost like a religious conversation, right? Sometimes, and you land on the wrong side of that, yeah, that yeah, discussion. But I, like to, to me, it's about like it, it's always about value, and and there's there's more than one path to the cloud, and you know the the spirit of DevOps to me is really. Uh, you, you know, accountable teams who can, who have the autonomy to make decisions. And, you know, certainly we are all biased towards Cloud Foundry. We think, you know, we understand and, and have experienced all the benefits. And, and they do eventually too, but, you know, not everybody starts with Cloud Foundry. Not everybody starts with Bosch. Yep. Sometimes you, you have to go through those, those, that learning experience, trial and error, um, and, you know, find your way to the... Mm -hmm. Away from the dark side. We absolutely didn't start with Bosch, you know. So we had a, uh, we, we went with one of the managed service providers initially, and we cut our teeth on kind of Cloud Foundry that way and built out our pipelines and um, engaged our development community. And then we realized after that what value Bosch could, yeah. could add. Uh, it was hard, right? And it's kind of the, the day one Bosch story is fairly gnarly, but I think the, the kind of wins that you get on day two are worth the pain. Mm. Just hang in there. Now, <laughs> Nicholas, you're coming in as kind of the freshest user on the stage here, so you're benefiting a little bit from, from their pain. Um, do you still, in starting up, what kind of pain points did you experience? You know, may, maybe uh, some pain points. At the, the, the first day of Bosch, I completely joined this uh, the first day of Bosch is complex and it's hard, it's tough. But at the end, for the availability of the platform, you see the results. So you mentioned uh, the whole patching of the platform. We didn't say it because it's obvious, but we have to remind that it's without any downtime. Just uh, and that's a real value for, for the platform. So uh, yes, pain points is the, the curve to learn stuff. Mm. So learn Bosch. Learn the whole Cloud Foundry ecosystem. It's quite complex, but after uh, some time, so we have no, now maybe nine nine months of existence on our platform. We have application in prods. We have no major incident in terms of security, in terms of just uh, operation of the platform. So, so that's we are really satisfied. You know, you know what else too. I think it, like you're just getting started, and and for anyone who is getting started, when you think about the myriad of choices you have to make, all of the options, right? Containerization, platform deployment mechanisms, and then you you think about the most important one, which is the people, and how do you how do you transform those people and expose them to technology in a way where you have some guardrails, yet you still have the flexibility. This is where I, you know, in, in our experience. Uh, we have seen the strength of Cloud Foundry really shine. Yeah. It enables you to go fast and experience value. And you know, at the end of the day, revenue is still the scorecard, right? So we still have to deploy our applications, but it diffuses some of the complications and some of the, the traditional slowness in building your own platform. We're spending five years building a platform, and then you realize you're the only consumer of that platform. Now, you're hinting at the culture change that comes with implementing something like Cloud Foundry which is not easy on everybody. It's, uh, you know, especially maybe in the government, for example, you might. Well, I, I think um, <laughs> when we were chatting yesterday, it became clear that all of us have experienced like, big internal debates as to what direction people want to go with our infrastructure. Um, Cloud Foundry offers some wonderful abstractions. Um, they're quite amazing in terms of what they offer you. Um, Whereas, say, something like 
running your own Kubernetes is you have loads of choices to make. Some people like that, but whether making those choices delivers value is like we're still trying to decide that ourselves. I think one of the things, uh, Boeing being a government contractor, one of the things that was important for us is the culture change, as I mentioned. Uh, and what we were able to accomplish by making technology easy to use and abundantly available, and in fact, we made it free as well internally. Um, we focused on the culture, and, and what that do, did is we transformed and, and formed a different business and IT working relationship, uh, co-locating and solving business problems. And in fact, our business in the next generation airplane development programs and, and other key developments that I can't really talk about, <laughs> that we're, we're leveraging this Please go ahead, chain. talk about them. Yeah, well, well then I'll have to, anyway. <laughs> um, but we're leveraging it to really accomplish the velocity on even non-traditional, non-software um, areas. So that's been pretty fruitful for us. And I just have to put this in, uh, plug in, we are hiring. Uh, in across the globe, um, so Seriously? please, yeah, let me know. <laughs> Anybody not hiring here? Uh, we're, we're hiring too. Right. Everybody, everybody, I, they're I all hiring. It. There you go. And I'm afraid there's a big sign here that says our time is up because they only gave us 20 minutes. So uh, thank you, guys. I know there's about 50 other topics we could talk about, but we'll, we'll just do that next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.